Hello, and welcome back. Welcome back to the second part in our series on Unlocking Creativity, part two, Talks at Google. My name is Monica Walsh, again, and I am on the Photos, Streams, and Sharing team here at Google, and it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome you back to this series. We are about to have some of the most highly acclaimed composers, musicians, and producers on the stage here at Google, and I am screaming in my skin about the sheer talent and intellect that we're about to see. I was backstage, and listening to them riff was remarkable. So you're in for a treat, everyone. Before I uh, let them loose on stage, I want to take some time to introduce them and honor them for their accomplishments. So listen up. <laughs> Let's welcome back to the stage Mr. Kenny Warner. <laughs> Kenny, Kenny performed last night at the San Francisco Jazz Center, and uh, we all know him. So welcome back, Kenny. Our next guest is most famous, famously known for his time in a band called <coughs> The Cure. You might have heard of them. I danced my butt off to them in college. Roger grew up in East London, born into a musical family, and studied art and design. He felt a ha he's felt a happy tension between his love for art and design and his passion for music. Now, in his solo career, his work bridges both worlds. Having released eight albums, including his biggest project, which debuted in London, called Quieter Trees, this is a suite he wrote, performed for chamber orchestra, based on a painting by David Hockney. In 2011, he was asked to rejoin The Cure to take another tour. Of course, he said yes. Some of his fans from my generation are really excited about that. Roger continues to pursue his solo career alongside his work with The Cure and proclaims to feel the freest he has ever felt in his entire career. We'll hear more about that on the panel. Let's welcome to the stage Mr. Roger O'Donnell. I don't remember saying any of that. <laughs> As I was getting to know this next artist, Terrace Martin, I noticed the way his creative work was described, very similar to a fine wine. He just debuted his recent album, Velvet Portraits, at the San Francisco Jazz Center, Center last night. Here, here is how his music has been described. He never stays in one place for too long, yet maintains a breezy spirit. He fuses jazz, G-rap, hip hop, and is often the binding agent in all of his projects. Terrace Martin is a multi-instrumentalist, two-time Grammy award-winning music producer, and is perhaps most well known for his producing records of prominent artists like Kendrick Lamar, Snoop Dogg, and Stevie Wonder, to name a few. He is a rare genius music producer in Los Angeles, and we are incredibly fortunate to have him here today. Please welcome to the stage Mr. Terrace Martin. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> Next, Mr. Philip Glass is a world-renowned composer, pianist, whose work spans generations. There is no doubt Philip Glass has had a transforming presence 
in our musical and intellectual lives. In the last 25 years alone, Glass has composed more than 20 operas, eight symphonies, two piano concertos, soundtracks to films, and still maintains his expansive solo creations on both piano and organ. Philip grew up in Baltimore, studied at Juilliard, and moved to Europe, where he trained with Nadia Boulangar and worked closely with the composer, Ravi Shankar. Philip Glass is best known for his repetitive structures in music and has developed what some call minimalist music. When he returned to New York in the late 60s, he formed the Philip Glass Ensemble and still performs with that group to date. This November, Philip Glass turns 80, and he's still going strong. Wow. He has collaborated with Paul Simon, Yo-Yo Ma, to name a few, and he still presents lectures and performs solo keyboard concerts around the world. In 2011, he founded the Philip Glass Center, home for artists, scientists, and conservatists to collaborate and produce a culture of our renewal time. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Philip Glass. And the master conductor of this evening is going to be Mike Howley, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about him before he takes the stage. <laughs> so he'll be weaving our conversation together. Mike Howley is the founder of the EG Conference. He has, his background is well suited for the role today of conductor or facilitator of our discussion. He's an artist, educator, researcher, and previously a professor at MIT. <coughs> He's co-founded several groundbreaking research programs, including Think, Things That Think and Toys for Tomorrow. He was born in a suburb of New York, studied music and computer science at Yale, and did his doctoral work at MIT. Mike Howley is himself an accomplished pianist and organist, having won the prestigious first prize in 2002 at the Van Cleburne Foundation International Amateur Competition. Maestro, I'll pass the baton to you. <laughs> can we pull our chairs a little more so we can kind of see each other? Because uh, if I'm supposed to be the referee, I need to know who to throw the flag at. Uh, it's too bad you had to bring a piano in for today. I mean, it's too bad because there should kind of be a piano here Always, right? I mean, why is it not? A I, I don't mean to just drop another uh, budget item in somebody's <laughs> bill, but you know, when I was starting next with Steve Jobs and the others, we had a piano. It, we had a Bersendorfer piano in the middle of the software lab, and meetings were sort of like jam sessions around a, an oddly shaped table. Mm. And who knew that Bud Tribble, who ran our software group, could play every show tune in the fake book? There was always music bubbling in the lab. And I'm just sort of curious, before we dive into our panel, how many of you uh, <coughs> play music? How many of you, OK, that's pretty good. Just keep your hands up. How many of you have a piano at home and should play it, but don't? <laughs> how, many of you, how many of you grew up in a home with a piano? Maybe. Um, uh, I was always struck by the fact that in the 19th century, the piano was sort of the internet. Every home had a piano. And the software that you used, you'd go out to the local shop and buy the latest whatever by Chopin or whomever and try it out on your own instrument. Uh, but it, it has interestingly different characteristics from, from our internet, obviously. But still, it was sort of the universal interface to music starting in the, in the early 1800s when the, the ingredients of, of technology at the time sort of converged. You had to have a cast iron industry to make a frame, and that made a piano loud enough and so forth. But, Every home had a piano, the same way that every home now has a computer and a portal out. It was a social connector, a very important and interesting 
instrument. I, that's sort of where I wanted to begin. Uh, I want to know where you guys all started. Did you all grow up in musical homes? Did you all grow up in a house with a piano? Were you playing music from an early age? Oh, yeah. Keyboards or? Uh, well, I started with the flute. And we were started only, with the flute? Yeah, we were only allowed to do one instrument in, at a time in, a, in my family. So I picked the flute. My brother played the piano. But I wanted to play the piano. So what I would do, I would, in those days, the teacher would come to your house. You could get a half hour lesson probably for $5 in those days. It's quite a while ago. Yeah. So, uh, but so what I would do is uh, when my brother was taking his piano lessons, I would sit in the room and listen. And as soon as the teacher left, I would run, run over and play the lesson. And my brother would chase me around the house because he thought I was stealing his, his lesson, which I was. <laughs> Uh, and, Something uh, all composers learn young. Uh, so uh, later on, I, I, I reminded him about this, him about this many times, that uh, uh, I ended up uh, being a pianist, and partly due to, partly, probably due to my brother, actually. And uh, Terrence, do you, uh, do you prefer Terrence or Terry? We didn't get properly acquainted. It's, Terrence is fine. Terrence, OK. But for you, Go with on. all these, these <laughs> wonderful geniuses on stage, y'all can call me whatever y'all choose to call me. <laughs> it's OK. So you play saxophone, but how did you grow up? What, what Was it a musical household? Did you yeah, put keyboards it, around it, it with drums? Musical, it, 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 my father is a, a, a jazz musician, a jazz drummer. And my mother is a jazz pianist and, jazz, and a jazz vocalist. So I grew up in a strong jazz household and soul music. But my first instrument wasn't the piano nor the saxophone. My first instrument was something called an MPC 3000, which is the drum machine. <laughs> but it was, th th this was my first instrument because you know, I grew up in the 80s, in the late 80s, where uh, a lot of households, that we didn't, where I come, we didn't have pianos, you know, and the music that was being played in my, and that time was all hip hop. So instead of, you know, all the younger musicians, maybe in the 50s and 60s, wanted to play pianos and saxophones and everything now, because of hip hop, the whole culture shifted to where now, Younger musicians wanted to say, oh, what, how do you do that? That's called a drum machine. So then the drum machine replaced, not replaced, but the drum machine added on like a whole another extension of another instrument to a whole generation. So, and I come from that generation where the, where the drum machine and sampling the records that everybody was a part of just to get some type of information was all we had to do. So those were my first instruments. When did you take up the saxophone? I took up the saxophone in ninth grade after, um, uh, uh, I got into a, a, a young ruffle with the law in ninth grade, eighth grade, I think, and when one of my uh, neighbors in the neighborhood was a famous jazz drummer named Billy Higgins, and he was a huge mentor of mine for the whole community. So Billy Higgins said, when I got out of my ruffle with the law at a young age, he said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take you to go talk to my friend, and, you know, he he'll understand what you're, what you're going through. And his friend happened to be uh, this wonderful alto saxophonist by the name of J Jackie McLean. And Jackie McLean said, you know, you have a lot of time on your hand. You need to do something more than the drum machine. And I said, what should I do? He said, here. And he gave me a saxophone. And that's how the saxophone came into my life. And Roger, I know you started young on the piano. Was it there before you were? Or? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, I grew up in East London in a... Um, and kind of post-Victorian times, that most homes had a piano. It was where everybody would congregate to entertain everybody else. There was no television and no radio. But I was born a little after that period. But <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I was born actually at home next to the piano. So um, from uh, the minute I could stand, I would play it. And as we spoke about earlier, my mum would, our next door neighbor, she would know when my mum had reached the dining room because she, she could, would hear the piano start playing when she was cleaning the house. So I would sit underneath and push the keys up. And then I was big enough, I would sit on top and push the keys down. Hmm. <laughs> and then my brother taught me to play 12-bar blues, and then I had piano lessons. So it was always there. It was always in the house. And a lot of houses in, in that kind of era, that uh, area of London had pianos. Sure. It wasn't like a, you know, an expensive thing, it sounded terrible. It was completely out of tune, <laughs> but uh, that's it. And Kenny, were your parents musical or? <clears throat> My father was very musical, but <clears throat> he didn't have the luxury of training. He, he had to support his 
family, uh, stepfather and mother and children. Then he had to support us. So, uh, but he had perfect pitch. He played alto saxophone by ear, mm. and we used to play together. And I know that whatever I got came from him. But, <clears throat> but we didn't have a piano. Uh, down the street, one of my friends was having a birthday party, and his father sat down and played piano. And I'd never seen one. I mean, I used to watch on television Victor Borger and Liberace, because they were on TV, and Jimmy Durante, who, by the way, way before the cream. Was it the cream that break all their instruments on stage? Jimmy probably stopped. Yeah, Jimmy, yeah, but way before that, you, Jimmy Durante would get so frustrated with the piano, he would literally break it until it was just sitting on the floor. And these are the guys I watched, and Chico Marx. Mm. Well, there's a great piano I love the Marx Brothers. But after I saw it live, I, I went home and I said, get me a piano. How old were you? A seven. And uh, <laughs> one of the things I said in my book, I said, you know, I went in there, I found I could plunk out any song I knew. And I ran into the kitchen, I said, hey, mom, good news, I won't need piano lessons. I just figured out how to play. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> so. so they got you a piano? Yeah, they did. They got a world, sir, with an, a rent with an option to buy. Should I take to it? <laughs> okay, where were you in the birth order? Did you have older brothers, younger siblings? Or? I had two very older brothers. You know, like wow, and they still years. paid enough attention to you to get you a piano. Well, my brothers weren't very happy about it. <laughs> you know, but yeah, no. Okay, so full disclosure. When I was about five years old, uh, we got a piano. It was the piano that my mother had grown up playing. And like any kid, I was drawn to it. Who could, I mean, you push a thing here, it makes sound. You pull your chin up over the lid and watch the things go up and down. As mom, please put your hand on the strings. Lie underneath it. It sounds completely different when you're on the floor. And I was, I was sort of hooked. But I got, uh, you know, I immediately started playing by ear, picking out little nursery tunes. My mom thought I should have lessons, maybe go to Juilliard. My dad thought, you know, maybe he should play sports or something. And so I got piano lessons. I had a total of four lessons, and my teacher quit. On the fourth lesson, she made my parents sit through it. She said, uh, now, Michael, since you obviously didn't practice any of the things I assigned to you, why don't you play something that you want to play? And I said, OK. And I had this crumbling piece of sheet music that I found in the bench of our piano. It was the Marine Corps hymn you know, from the halls of Montezuma. My dad was in the Marine Corps, and so I thought he'd appreciate this. I, I put this thing on the desk, and I start playing you know, with chords and everything, which is pretty good for five years old. And sh the teacher threw up her hands, and she said, look, he's playing in a completely different key from what's written on the page. <laughs> Save your money. Maybe he should take up football or something. I was out of there, you know, like a cork out of a champagne bottle, just no turn. And I, I played piano myself through high school, got an incredible teacher. Uh, in high school and took off like a rocket and came within a whisker, I would say, of embarking on a, on a professional career. I, I didn't go to Curtis, but I almost did, and then sort of veered off. But it's always been a, I'm, I mention this only because you guys are all professional musicians. I'm an amateur musician. Um, and I've, I often wonder how my life would have gone had I, had I punched through and stuck it out of Curtis. And, well, amateur means uh, you are a music lover. So we're all amateurs from that point of view. And I really believe that's true. What would you do if you weren't making a living at music? I'd probably have a hard time making a living. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, actually, I didn't actually make a living at music until I was in my 40s. So I did all kinds of other stuff. But I never took a, I never took a regular job because I, didn't, I was afraid of getting trapped in a job. I just did day work, and I did that for a long time. But let, let's talk a little bit, just a little bit, about our lives outside of music, because you surely have hobbies and things that you Pretty enjoy sure. doing that <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm so guessing sure. you might not. <laughs> uh, but some of us, you know, I, I often find things you do outside of the day-to-day -day help spark creativity in the, in the sort of mainstream of your life. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if you're a cook or if you're a... Uh, a camper or? I got that through collaborating with other people, with dancers, with filmmakers. Uh, I always, I, was, I, 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 I had the music spot, but I always, uh, I work with people who weren't musicians. And then eventually I began working with other musicians from people from Africa, from China, from Australia, from Mexico. So uh, uh, that, in, the encounters with other, with other artists, other performers, that was what was stimulating to me. 
Now, Richard, you, I know you're heavily into Moog synthesizers and things, so yeah. you have to be a part-time electronics hacker. <laughs> no, I have other people to fiddle with those things for me. Really? What do you do when this stuff breaks? Get somebody to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> you're not writing code software? Oh, no. No, no. That stuff gives me a headache. <laughs> I, I speak to, um, I use a lot, obviously, you use a lot of software. And I speak to those guys, and they, you know, they kind of, you say, can you make it do this? And they're like, yeah. And then you're like, wow, that's cool. And, and also instrument manufacturers are very good friends with the people at uh, Moog and Cyril, the main designer there. And he knows things that I would never know about uh, electronics. And uh, when he says, I can make it do this, I'm like, really? That's not anything that I would ever dream of. Uh, all I can do is make music. I can't make the instruments. I can tell him what I'd like it to do, but the things that they give us, you know, are amazing. When Bob started, and all of those guys, uh, Dave Smith, Tom Oberheim, all of those early guys, when they started making synthesizers and samplers, uh, you, like Terrace was saying about sampling, it just opened a whole new world for all of us and allowed us to... Uh, I mean, you can't uh, compare it to any other kind of art. If you think of a painter being given the kind of different tools that we were given as musicians, uh, just opens up a whole new world to you. When you sit at a Moog synthesizer and you, you can create the sounds, there's no other instrument you can do that with. Mm -hmm. So you're creating the colors that you can then paint the music with. So the, I don't know how to do it. I just know how to twiddle knobs. But it's interesting what you say about painters. I, um, I was uh, talking to a friend about the early Impressionists like Monet. Um, we often forget what the enabling technologies were at the time. His version of a synthesizer yeah, with paint. was paint in tubes. That was yeah. a major breakthrough. You, you didn't have to grind the paint in your studio. It meant you could take a little box of paints, go out, squirt yeah. it on a little palette, paint in open air and capture the same sort of impression that an early photographer might get. Yeah, OK, you having said that, I'm, as Monica referenced earlier, I'm a huge fan of David Hockney. And every time some new technology comes along, he embraces it. And he takes his art somewhere else. So I guess they do have the parallel you know, uh, with technology that we've, we've had. But the huge advances in keyboards was amazing for, for me in the, from the 70s through to the well, it's still going on. It's kind of micro. But so Kenny Roger kind of grew up at the perfect moment in history when all these little devices and contraptions were evolving by leaps and bounds. How did you manage to avoid that and stick with just a piano? Well, it was very intimidating. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I didn't manage to avoid it. I managed to, I what, couldn't manage to embrace it. But of course, the piano is really one of the first synthesizers in music. Sure. And you've got three strings, that's signal. And then when they put the felt on the hat, before that, you know, it was like very, you know, the harpsichord, that was just wood on, on metal. But when you put a felt on there, that's a filter, you know? So, I mean, really, arguably, the piano is the first synthesizer. Um, I got into it way later. I mean, I was, when I was at school, I took the ARP 2600, you know, the course, and I'd be like, oh, my god, this is like, like a science fiction movie, you know? I wasn't thinking in that way at all. I'm only a little better at it now. I, too look for, you know, I get sounds any way I can. And, uh, and then I, I like to stay on the side of the creative side, what the sound does to me. I can't switch back and forth to the technical side. It kind of kills, like, what am I going to write now? I get, it takes too much of my, that's me. There's some people that, like Terrace that, that thrive on that, you know, and I, I actually really admire that. You know? So, but do you write or design scores for multiple instruments? Is there almost entirely improvisational for you. Well, I, I, I compose on the computer because uh -huh. I'm left-handed and I have a lousy handwriting. And it was too much work. You know, lefties, when they would do copy work, they used to have a technique, you might remember this, they used to use a six-inch ruler and they put nickels on both sides so that the lefty could rest his hand on the ruler because every time you wrote, you That's kept scary. smudging everything. And it was just painful for me to, to write. When the computer came, that was just perfect for me. You know, note. Note value, note, quarter note, note, eighth note, quarter
chord, eighth note, you know. And then I went hog wild with it, and I, and I wrote a lot of music. Uh, finale or Sibelius, or something it else? It started with Sibe Finale, then someone convinced me to do Sibelius. That's the techies in the room. Isn't it? And then I decided to go back to Finale, because it's funny how your brain works. With Finale, you choose a note, and then you choose a note value. With Sibelius, you have to choose the note value, then you choose the note. Because otherwise, it'll do the note value of the previous note. And I just could not think that way. It was Terrence, do you write music down? I write music down. Using the same sort of stuff? Or no. I pen and paper? Pen and paper. Pencil, oh. pencil and paper. Pencil and paper. Pencil is probably a better strategy. Well, just, just, and I, I've always <clears throat> wrote music. I, I grew up in a strong jazz, bring the chart because we can't rehearse things. So um, I've been writing for years, but just recently uh, I started playing with Herbie Hancock. And, and I was trying to tell him, not tell him anything. I was, <laughs> I was suggesting to him, you know, look, he said, yo, you know, we're doing a new concert. And it's going to be me, you, Vinny Cayuta. And, you know, I said, oh, cool, man. Let's play all these, these songs that I grew up listening to you, your songs. But I have to remember, as a fan, Herbie hasn't played these songs since he recorded these songs, like a lot of these songs. So... This was the first time, I always write charts, but this was the first time it was charts with pressure. Because I have to write his songs. I have to transcribe his songs right and back. So I remember the first day of rehearsal going in a couple of weeks ago, and I'm passing out the charts. <laughs> but I didn't walk, I didn't give Vinny Cayuta a chart. And he said, hey, where, where's my chart? And I was like, where's it? Here. It's just, it's just a chord. I'll take it. And I said, OK, and you know, with writing music, you know, and I, I wrote a lot of it on the way there, and I should have did it two nights before. <laughs> so you kind of don't know. You, some, well, some, I'm sure you guys know, but me, I kind of don't know exactly. I have to make sure. I, I have to hear what, what they're going to play. And with jazz, they have to, we have to understand all the rules to be able to break the rules in that format. So writing that chart was deep. And this is when I realized I, I made a mistake, and Herbie said, you know you could get Finale in a program to do this now. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard, and I'm like, <coughs> thanks. So now I'm actually going to get, and this reminded me I have to get Finale. Finale, to get finale. So yeah. You know, it's interesting about Herbie. Um, I, I was just, he were, we were emailing last week about something else. There was a, a young, super talented pianist named Joey Alexander, who I think has played here at Google, if I'm not mistaken. Any of you heard Joey Alexander? Some hands. Awesome. He's like the Mozart of jazz. You, once a century, you get a, awesome. an otherworldly talent like this. And I was talking with um, Joey and his family, saying, well, you know, have you thought about going to school? And, and the answer was, well, yeah, but you know, Herbie dropped out. And, <laughs> and it, it's not my place to advise. I, I, you, in order to drop out, first you have to drop in. Yeah. And not only did he drop out, he dropped in and he finished a degree in jazz. Electrical engineering. Oh, yeah, that's right. Electrical Electri engineering. Yeah. <laughs> he was interested in computers. And yeah. lo and behold, you know, 10 years later, when a sort of fusion jazz movement gets going, he's right in the thick of it, because he's, he's interested in these little things and gizmos and gadgets, software, hardware. He's, he's got. Yeah, and he always thinks ahead. He's not, and this is something I, I, I'm sure nobody <laughs> is, he's not in no particular box. You know? And I think that's the big thing with creativity, is just to burn the box. You know. Philip, in, in your world, are you a, a kind of a computer guy? What, what are the ingredients, the tools of your trade? Pencil and paper. Pencil and paper. Actually, what happened, the big crisis for me was when uh, uh, people stopped making music paper. Uh, they there stopped? Was a of, yes. So you had uh, to get a computer to print your own music uh, paper? No, I just found a printer. <laughs> I found someone to do it for me. But uh, for years, I mean, I, there were four, yes. three or four different places in New York where I could go. I could buy paper with different tints and different sizes, and I would, it was part of the fun was going and buying the paper, and they all went out of business. Then I got for a while, there was, some, there was a company called Judy Green. I don't know who Judy, but I don't think Judy Green really existed, but it was a company in LA, and they would send it to you overnight. But then, then she disappeared, or the, that disappeared. And then I thought, well, maybe I could find, I, I would just buy the printer or something, and then, Someone who worked with me said, no, no, we'll just get someone, just tell me what you want, and I could, I could get paper made for me, custom made. It didn't cost any more than the other paper did. But I have all kinds. 
it, it, it helps, for me, believe it or not, it helps to have the right paper. I mean, oh, I everybody believe. has their own little, and I have to have the right pencil too, you know that kind of thing. I, I, I don't know what, how that translates into computers, but I have to have, I, I, my tools are, are very, I'm very familiar with them. So if we were to walk into your studio, aside from the paper and pencils and presumably a pencil sharpener, what else is there? Is there a keyboard? <laughs> and piano. a piano? You got a piano? Yeah, sure. You compose at the keyboard? A little bit, or you work out Especially ideas? Especially uh, some things. With uh, piano music, for sure. But uh, the big pieces, like the operas and symphonies, you can't really play it on the piano. You can play parts of it. So. You, you get, so what you can do, you can play part of it, and then you have to match any other part of it. But uh, um, I don't uh, work. Then what I, what I, in my studio, I have, that's what I have at home. I have a, an office downtown where there are some young fellows there who take the music and they, they put it in their computer. <laughs> and then, and then, we can, then we can make changes and we can make corrections and all kinds of things. Print out parts. All that has to happen. All the music preparation has to happen. But... Uh, but in fact, now here's an interesting thing. Uh, when pe when I, some, someone will call and say, I'm playing this piece of yours and look at this measure and so forth, and is this an E or an F? And I say, I have no idea. And they said, well, didn't you write it? And I said, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> so, but but there's, I've written so much music, I, forget, I obviously don't remember it. But what I do now, I learned to do this a long time ago. I saved the manuscript. I saved the first sketch. And, and, uh, and, I, I, and I've, I've learned to do this. I write on the page, uh, you know, page three, page four, uh, and uh, the name of the piece, too. So I can find, so when I have to find out, is it an E or an F, I go and take a look, because I don't remember most of the time. And it could be, very often, it could be either one. You know how that can be. Uh, well, maybe enough sharp, but, but that's about it. But you have to be practical about it. And well, I found out, so what we have uh, in my, uh, my studio, which I so have other people doing the preparation and doing the, uh, the computer stuff, but uh, the, the, uh, what we have is that the, the MS means in my industry, the, the MS is always right. No, the, it's not always right, but it's pretty much always right. In other words, if I, if I have to go back to a piece I wrote two or three years ago, and look at some measure that I had forgotten, I had even written. All bets are off. I, I take a look at I take a look at the MS, and 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 uh, now that doesn't mean I always keep it that way. I may say, you know, maybe I should, maybe it is an E or something. But uh, uh, the 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 great thing of, now, there's another good thing about having writing writing musical music paper. I have I have uh, manuscripts of everything I've written. Now, most of my friends just have files. Now that's okay. Except you can't sell the files to anybody. <laughs> I was going to say that's a good investment. <laughs> Ernie, what's in your studio? What's well, your ideal uh, studio? Computer, a big, uh, my ideal studio. I don't know that, I don't even know, but computer, large screen. I like manuscript on, on the screen, so I had to wait for the 32 inch screen to be invented yeah. so that I could see the whole score. Mm. And, um, uh, a beautiful piano, a set of drums, because sometimes I like to come at it from the drums. Um, Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> so that I don't have to just sit there doing music all day. You know. I know it's important. Roger, what's in your... Uh, oh, well, I was just going to say about manuscript paper, because in the rock world, we don't use it. And the one thing that our accountant always claims for us every year is for manuscript paper, because he thinks it's a, what musicians use. <laughs> so he said, like, what have you claimed for us this year? Oh, well, I've put down the manuscript paper, and like, we'll look at it, and we go, Poor. we don't even know what it looks like. Well, you must write on something, backs of envelopes, or? <clears throat> no, I, well, I play into logic. I use logic. Mm -hmm. I just play into it, and I use um, the Vienna Symphony Library of samples for composing with. Orchestra. And I just, because I'm not a trained musician, I don't, I need the inspiration of hearing what I'm, what I'm writing in. So when I hear it back, and the better it sounds, like that uh, sample library is so incredible that it just inspires you to add parts and put other instruments in. But my, my studio revolves completely around my Mac and my screen and an input. Uh, I've got a weighted keyboard, a Kawaii, 
That's this virtual uh -huh. piano. Uh, it's really good. It's got the action of a grand piano. Uh, I have a piano in the house, but I don't record with it. I use um, ivory, mm. the sample, piano sample, which is amazing. Let's talk about um, kind of the extra musical influences and impacts like dance and movies and things. I, um, <clears throat> well, talk about your discovery of Well, uh, I can't, uh, who, was, who was talking recently, um, earlier about, well, um, Philip was saying about stage that we don't get to talk very often to other musicians or we don't get to talk to people from different because we're all, always doing our own thing. And actually, I find more inspiration from talking to other disciplines, other artists, visual artists, dancers, um, writers, than I do from talking to musicians. Um, that may be the rock world, and they're not generally very inspiring musicians. <laughs> but when you talk to any artist that's passionate about what they do, inspires me. Uh, and most recently, it's been in dance. I, I saw my first ballet four or five years ago. And since then, I, I can't write music without thinking about dance. And it's such a natural uh, combination to me that music makes people dance, that it's a natural thing to do when you write. Uh, and Terrace does a lot in the dance world, so I'm sure he understands and knows where I'm coming from. It's just that feeling of, of having somebody dance to something that you've created. Uh, I recently, um, just before Christmas, I performed one scene of an upcoming ballet uh, in Moscow at the Kremlin Palace, and we were in rehearsals in the Bolshoi with the okay, two. Okay, wait, 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 wait. You what? should stop right there. <laughs> I mean, the, mind blowing uh, to spend so many years as a keyboard player <laughs> in a rock band, I've been very and lucky. then just casually write a ballet that's being performed with the Bolshoi <laughs> at the Kremlin. I, mean, oh, wow. I thought, if you. Uh, I don't know. I, obviously, I've been very lucky to be accepted into different worlds that I go into. And, <clears throat> and I think it's to do with the passion that you take with you for your music. And it's always interpretable by other people with passion. Um, so back to the rehearsal. So we're in the re main rehearsal room in the Bowl Show where incredible ballets have been <laughs> created. And we were rehearsing. Was, I was playing piano with four cellos. And there were two dancers. And we, we did a run through. And then we stopped for a break. And then I was rehearsing a, a piece with the, with the cellos. They were, they were all Russian. They could speak English. And they were all called Masha. But, uh, but I know how to count to four in Russian now. So it's quite useful. <laughs> so I said, let's just go over this piece. So we started to play it. And um, the dancer is also called Masha. Got up and started dancing. Like, just naturally got up and started dancing to what we are doing. And that was such an incredible feeling to do that. So that's uh, the thing that I love at the moment. Uh, just, but it's about passion. And when uh, a young musician comes up to me now and they ask for advice, and we all know how difficult it is right now, I tell them that if they don't have passion about what they're doing, then they should probably find something else. Terence, have you tried things outside of, say, jazz clubs in movies or? other uses for music, so to speak? Definitely. Um, you know, for once again, for me, being a product of hip-hop, the whole culture, hip-hop is one of the most accepting art form of everything coming into one, whether it's rock, classical, jazz, I mean, any form, we accept everybody. We believe everybody's one, definitely. So, and also through hip-hop, you, it's, it's, hip-hop is not a music. It's, 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 it, it, it's not a color, it, it, it's just a thing. It's a thing that we all could be a part of. And when you're a, a, a product of such a strong culture like that, you're involved and you're inspired by the people around you. Like my music, at maybe in my earlier years of playing music, God, it was inspired by a lot of other musicians. John Coltrane, Pete Rock, Dr. Dre, Lenny Kravitz, Snoop. You know, it was inspired by so many different things, but now, as, as I've gotten older, children, and I live life, I'm really more inspired by life more than music right now. So I find joy into meeting people, getting to know people, shaking everybody's hands, seeing what you're about, what you're about, what are you turned on by, especially children. Especially children, because they're the most honest. If they don't like your music, they're like this. 
Yeah. <laughs> I just spent a year writing this. <laughs> and you know what? Children, especially young ones, they don't, they don't know terms like hip hop, classical, jazz, rock, anything. They just know what makes them dance and yeah. it feels good. That's right. So yeah. going back to the dance, you know, and, and I, I said last night, I believe the heart is the, is the first drum, and I believe, you know, dancing is the first form of anything that music can really even make you kind of move. Everybody in here, when you hear music, the first impulse is to dance, whether it's bobbing your head or, or, or that situation. And even like when somebody walks to me, I see dance in that. You know what I'm saying? That's why I'm inspired by people living. I, I'd rather play, instead of how that bass line sounds, I'd rather play how that person's taking that picture sitting like that. And like, you know, I'd rather play the music that, I don't know if that makes sense, but feels. You got me, is that, is that a better shot of me? <laughs> but I'd rather play, what is the soundtrack of his life? What's the soundtrack of her life? What's the soundtrack of your life? You know, that's more what I'm into. So with me, <clears throat> as long as I stay inspired by that, and I, I, that's, I'll never run out of ideas because I'm always inspired by life instead of something that's playing on the radio. Like, I'm so inspired by sitting here. It's like, I'm, <laughs> if, don't, if, don't if I got his number, I would call him 30 times a day. <laughs> 30 times a day. You don't get 50 my times number. a day, because you do keyboards. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's, it's just, that's just the whole. You know what you're saying about when you start and you're listening, you, you've got all of these influences coming through you. Like when you're talking about Herbie, when I started playing Fender Rhodes, I learned every one of his solos from Headhunters, Thrust, mm -hmm. that whole period. And it's that moment when you become yourself. When Philip said, when he sits at the piano and it sounds like him, that's a key moment of when you, everything that's gone into you comes out as you. And it's important that we pass that on. What happens when you get stuck? What do you do to get unstuck? Or do you never get stuck trying to work out a, a two? I don't, have time to get not, I don't have time to get stuck. Mm. I just keep going. <clears throat> Too much pressure. I just keep going. Sometimes I throw, I throw things away for a day. You know, I've thrown away enough stuff. But, uh, but it was stuff I had to write down to throw it away, if you know what I mean. Well, you know, the, the, the thing that happens to me, uh, I'm a, a little bit older than some of you guys here, but the interesting thing happens when, uh, as part of the process of, of, of aging, really, I begin to hear differently. I'm hearing differently now than I did before. And it's changing the music. Differently how? I hear different things. Like? Notes, what do you want to call them? I mean, I hear different music. Uh -huh. You know, this, uh, for me, the, uh, uh, let's say that dancing is about moving, painting is about seeing, poetry is about actually speaking, music is about hearing. Most of the time I'm trying to, I'm trying, I'm listening to music, I'm trying to figure out how the hell to write it down. The hardest part is writing down what I hear, because I, and you look and say, is that what I really heard? Do you, do you have you to go through that? Well, when I get stuck, I just, I, I just walk away. That's probably more sensible. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of people would say that, and then I come back and go, oh, of course, I shouldn't do that. You know, like next morning, it's, have you ever had that? that uh, you, know, you take a break, and you come back, and it's obvious now, what to do I, next? I have a, a completely different problem. I have people who think they know my music, and, and they, I, I send them a new piece, and they say, oh, there are a lot of mistakes in the music. I said, I'm not sure. And they said, so we go over the score. It turns out, I said, I said, I said that can't be a G. And I said, please play the G. Play it. Mm. And uh, uh, just, just the other day, I, a friend of mine was conducting a piece for two pianos and an orchestra. And he said, oh, it's, he hadn't had the rehearsal yet. He said, it's, very, it's too, it's overwritten, it's too heavy. I said, I know I'm hearing it that way. I'm, I'm hearing very thick music now. And he said, no, 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 it's too much. So he called me the next day and he said, well, I tried it your way, it sounds better. Mm -hmm. So he said, and he never had ever admitted that he could 
before that, he would say that, no, no, he knew what the right notes were, and I, I didn't. But no historian would say, well, you were right, now I wasn't. Now I was really amazed that he, but uh, I'm hearing things differently than I did. And that'll, with luck, you'll live long enough so that'll start to happen. According to neurologists, people who study the brain, the brain is, continues to evolve. Maybe it's devolving, I don't know. <laughs> but it's changing. The, the structure of the brain is, we can, we're still getting new ideas. Uh, and what that translates into is that you hear differently. It's a damnedest thing. You hear, you actually hear differently. The thing that you said about uh, whether you can translate what you hear in your head to what comes out. That's the hardest that's part. That's an in incredibly difficult thing. Yeah. And that Everybody. something is this big when you hear it in your head, and it has to come like this to get out so that somebody else can hear it. And when it's like that, it's incredible. When it gets to that, let's hope it's still good, but it's never as good as that. You know, I do it a little differently because I cannot for the life of me plan out, hear something and say, oh, let me try to capture that. So what I do is I throw stuff out there. I, you know, some people start writing and then they say, let me see if I can create the illusion of chaos. So I start with chaos and then I keep pulling things out hmm. until it sounds like there's a system that I might have thought about all along. You got <laughs> you to figure it out real good. Oh. <laughs> well, it's the only way I could do it. I, you know, someone said you have to tell a story First of all, you didn't ask me with influence. My biggest influence is movies, Getting hands it. down. <laughs> movies, hands down. Every chord has an emotion. You know, I, you wanted people to touch the piano. Other yeah. than, you know, for example, you know, this is like, uh, and I've watched so many movies that, you know, this is warmth, this is, uh, you know, nobility. You know, now it's a little bit of doubt. You know? And now it's freedom. But not for too long. <laughs> you know, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, that when I'm thinking movies, I can really play. When I'm thinking piano, well, piano I can't play. This is a man who's made friends with the piano. <laughs> and I, I, I've never been that friend. I, to me, it's always been, I have to work, I still work at playing the piano. I'm still practicing. That's the problem. <laughs> no, Can I tell you a funny story? Good, please. Uh, Walter Norris was a great piano player. He, he passed away a couple years ago with a heart attack. And, and he was one of these guys, these chronic practicers. And he practiced all day, got carpet and tunnel. I don't practice all day. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, and like he, had, he had a, his first heart attack. And the doctor told him, we, we were friends, and the doctor told him, you could only play 50, practice 15 minutes a day. Wow. So Walter lived in, in, in Berlin. He emails me, he goes, can you imagine? The doctor told me I can only practice 15 minutes a day. I emailed him back, you mean every day? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I, I, you know, for me, I do it a little different. I have do, everybody does it the way they have to do it. You know, there's a way in. And of course, you don't, I don't think anybody on this <clears throat> stage uh, is hampered by what's the way in. Once they find the way in for them, yeah, you know, I think that's right? The, I think that's the only, yeah. only way. The, the, these, uh, the method becomes very personal. And, and in a way, uh, it becomes impossible to really teach it to someone. They have to find their own way. Yeah, a couple of points came up that just reminded me of some of my early experience. It has to do with learning to hear music. One of the typical exercises a, a kid will get in music school is to harmonize a, a line. You get a melody, like a chorale melody, and you're going to write three voices underneath. And one of the first things you struggle with is trying to hear all four voices at one time in your head. It is an unnatural act. And there's a moment at which you finally do begin to get a sense of how, how these different threads sound inside without even playing them on the keyboard. And then, of course, you pick up an arrangement that Bach did of the same tune, and you think, geez, why didn't I think of that? I mean, look at that miraculous, that one idea, he still, you know the feeling? Um, but it, it's sort of the first big threshold that I remember crossing in, in learning music, that you could begin to hear these things without just having to thump them out on the keyboard. And that's why I'm fascinated by your perspective now. You say that music sounds 
different and you're hearing different things mm -hmm. in it. And uh, I'll be parsing that for a while, I guess. Um, <clears throat> failures. Are there any interesting failures that spring to mind? What, that we're going to admit to? <laughs> yeah, no, that's the whole point. <laughs> we're not going to admit to any Forget failures. Forget about the two million people that are tuned We've, in on We probably time. fail uh, nine times out of ten, but they don't get to hear it, do they? What's well, a question of attitude? Well, what's failure, though? That's my... Yeah, you have to uh, find see. that first. You know, I have something I've been telling my students just lately. Um, yeah, not, in a way, it's kind of you can't. It's kind of irrelevant, you know. Not to, you know. I've been telling my students it takes faith and uh, trust. You trust your hands, and then whatever comes out, you have the faith that it worked, even if it didn't. You know, and then again, that's a way of opening the channel. I was, when I was listening to you play those beautiful Bernstein tunes with different harmonies, fun harmonies, delicious harmonies, um, I was thinking, well, you know, there's not really any wrong notes in there. And then I remembered Franz Liszt used to tell his piano students, there's, there's no wrong notes. There's, there's, they're uninvited guests. <laughs> <laughs> and if they turn up, you try to make them feel at home. You know, you improvise around it. And or, or invited guests, you know. I mean, I, Some, Miles Davis said... Don't fear mistakes, there are none. Everybody knows some version of that, but there's a funny story about, and Herbie in the first chapter of his book talks about the first chord he played, he was so intimidated playing with Miles Davis, it was totally wrong, and then Miles took that chord and he like created some new music. <clears throat> but there's one other funny story, I had heard Charlie Parker was playing, he would always play with local rhythms, Charlie Parker's a great play, bebop saxophone player. He would always play with local rhythm sections. That's what they did. You know, there was a in Cincinnati, uh, wherever. And he was this piano player to pick him up every day. And Charlie Parker never said a word to him. He picked him up. Charlie got in the car. They got out. So I took his horn. They played the whole night. Got back in the car. Never said a word to him. And one night, this piano player played completely the wrong chord. And Charlie goes, mm, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I hear you. <laughs> it was the only thing he said to him all week. <laughs> um, how about um, kind of big flashes of inspiration? Do those ever happen where suddenly, you, you, you know, something goes off and, and it's like the floodgates are open and you're off to the races? I, I call those lucky days. Lucky days. <laughs> yeah, they come now and then, occasionally. Occasionally. And it's wonderful when it happens because it means, well, I guess that happened to Schubert and Mozart all the time. But, you know. I don't know. It I can think happen there's... even to ordinary people like us. Uh -huh. And then it does. It's a one, it's a beautiful thing. I, I've written uh, one whole piece that it, it was like writing a letter to someone. I never didn't change the note. The whole opera. And I mm. said, "Wow, that was that was a freebie." <laughs> but you know, getting about uh, this. There's another thing that I was talking about failures, which is an interesting question. Uh, uh, if you if your music over time changes enough, and it eventually it does for most people after a while, then you find that you've written a piece that surprises you. And my first instinct is that maybe I better not show it to anyone. And then I say, no, I want this. I'll just play it, give it to the orchestra, and they'll play it, and we'll see what happens. And no one has that response except me. I'm the one that's most puzzled and alarmed by something that is radically different from what I did before. I'm completely alarmed by it. And I've learned to just shut up, <laughs> hand the music out, and listen to it. Uh, there, is, there seems to be another entity operating in some ways where they think things can happen. And uh, the big changes in my music have often been perceived to me as failures, which I later came to find out that I actually had made of some fundamental change in my thinking, which I wasn't aware of until I began to hear it back. Does that ever? Yeah. Absolutely. I think those moments when you go back into the studio and listen, listen back to what you wrote the day before, and you think, where did this come from? Mm -hmm. Who wrote this? Those are amazing moments. Well, of course, you look at it, but I listen to you it. You say, what jackass wrote this piece? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's going nowhere. 
those are amazing moments, and you just think, uh, those are the moments you also think, I can't do this again. I'll just stop now. That's as good as it's ever going to get. You know, I have a lot of people working with me in different ways, copying music, <coughs> different music. And you can't, I we can't, all you can't believe you. how many of them Philip, tell me I, the I, 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 I've written wrong notes. And they said, no, this is the wrong note. They said, no, we're in the wrong note. But uh, uh, that's been actually, um, I've learned to defend the, the wrong notes because I know mm. the right notes. Mm. But the people I work with, they're not used to the wrong notes. And I'm not used to them either, but I know that they're right even though they sound wrong. <laughs> it's a question of, you know, I've just moved into a different neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's exciting when that happens. It's exciting to, uh, to, to be that close to failure, if you see what I mean. I think that's when you actually are pushing where you're going, isn't it? Yeah. If, you're, if you're out of your comfort zone so much that you think you're failing, then you're actually pushing your boundary. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard. If you're the one on the boundary, and you're, you're pretty much there by yourself. Yeah. Especially all the people that work with you are telling you you, you got it wrong. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, they know, but they're thinking about a different piece. And I remember reading one little thing from uh, Stravinsky, I think. He'd get a commission. Uh, who was it? Cole Porter was asked how he got his inspirations for his songs. And he said, nothing's more inspiring than a phone call from a producer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that gets it started, right? So Stravinsky would get a commission, he'd start working away, and he'd wind up with a stack of paper that just didn't fit, you know? He'd have half of another piece that for one reason didn't, didn't work with how he was doing it. He wouldn't throw it away. He'd just set it to one side. We all wish we had that piece, he almost yeah. did. <laughs> <laughs> You're so modest. You, I mean, you, you said something earlier about how Schubert and Mozart were different. They're not like us. Why do you think they were not like us? Well, I've said this to people uh, that uh, don't, don't exp uh, you know, the, don't, uh, you're as likely to meet a Schubert or a Mozart as to see an angel walking on the street. I feel they, the same way about happen. Art Tatum. What? I feel the same way about Art Tatum. I listen to the Tatum recordings well, of jazz piano. They exist and they happen over. and in a way, uh, uh, they're frightening and inspiring, but uh, uh, if someone thinks that, maybe someone thinks that's you. And then, but you don't think it's you. You know, it's hard for us to accept sometimes that kind of. Uh, I think people would probably think it's you. Hmm? With your career, I think people would probably think it's you. <clears throat> well, th 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 some, for a long time, that got me into a lot of trouble, actually. <laughs> I got booed off a lot of stages. I don't know about you guys, but, and but the, by the orchestras. <laughs> After the piece was done, with the conductor next to me, and the audience was clapping, and the, and the orchestra was hissing me. That's how <laughs> some of the best orchestras in this country, the Philadelphia Orchestra, the Cleveland Orchestra, the Boston Orchestra. All right, then I have a question. After that kind of experience, how do you I felt going? great. Because <laughs> I wasn't there. So it didn't throw you Look, off your path no, at all? No, those guys were stuck where they were, and I wasn't. Yeah. I, I actually, I just laughed it off. We've got about 15 or 20 minutes, and I know there's a lot of uh, ideas and questions in the audience and a couple of microphones. I, it would be impolite of me not to say, hey, if you want to step up and ask a question, fire away. Could you go to the microphone here? And I'm not going to call at you because I, I can't really see. Go, please. So uh, something you all have said reminded me of a technique that I've used when I get into a state where I feel like my music's all sounding the same. I shut off the lights, sit down at the piano without being able to see the keyboard, just play two notes. And then from there, try to work it until you get to something that's consonant. And that takes away the whole notion of what key you're in and what notes you're playing, and you just hear the music. And I wondered if you all have tried anything like that or if you have other techniques that you use to keep yourself from sounding stale. Well, I, I find that the, uh, playing in one key and then playing in the other key very tonally kind of satisfies me in a kind of weird way. Um, I'll also just, uh, sometimes I just play with my entire, you know, from elbow to elbow, but Christmas carols. You know, I just like doing that. You know, it's just, 
kind of strange, you know? No, was, I, was, I wanted to do a whole record of Christmas carols that way, <coughs> and, and my wife won't let me. Let me ask you, can, <laughs> well, ask you a question. Uh, it looked to me like you were, your eyes were closed most of the time. You weren't watching your fingers. No, I try not to watch. Yeah, you, you're basically listening all yeah. the time. Yeah. And imagining someone else is doing it. That really helps. Thank you very much. This has been amazing. Roger, you talked about playing music and it inspired you to add stuff. Kenny, you talked about starting with chaos and taking parts out. Terrence, especially as a producer with other artists, do you ever, is it hard to know when it's done? When the piece or the record is okay, it's done. They always have to tell me to stop. <laughs> they always have to tell me to stop. Um, <clears throat> for me, I kind of, you know, everybody feeds off different energy, how they work. Everybody's inspired by different things. Um, and usually with the records I produce, it's always this quiet deadline. It's quiet deadlines, and I call them where they're rushing you, but they never give you a date when you have to turn, take a record into mastering. So take, for instance, when, when I produced the Kendrick Lamar album, we had years, we had three or four years, three years to produce that record. And uh, I, I produced a lot of records, but we didn't really click in to the last four months when they said, we're going to master on January 3rd. And then for some reason that fueled me and then instead of adding more things to the music, I, list, I stopped myself. I listened to, how you said, going back in the studio? And I listened back and I said, whoa, I need to start subtracting things instead of adding things. And then um, usually I have somebody next to me that knows nothing about harmony, nothing about all my keyboards, and they just know how it makes them feel. And I always say I trust those people really a lot more than musicians when it comes to creative things. And usually I, I, I have a crew of people that I, I look at, they don't even know, I, they probably know now, they don't even know I look at them on the side of me going, if they say, in hip hop, if they say it's too jazzy, that means in hip, it doesn't mean it's too good, it means it's too much going on. The whole, the, 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 the conversation is different. <clears throat> it's too jazzy. Okay, take out some instruments. It's too, like, you know, I'll do an R&B song and put amazing, Print style distortion guitar. They'll say it's two Guns N' Roses. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll say, okay, that means turn down the, you know. So it's, it's a few mechanisms that I do use when to stop, when I'm working on other artists' records. On my records, I don't care what nobody says. I go all the way in. <laughs> if it's the last song of about it, three seconds, and if I want to get an orchestra, if that was my heart tells me to do, I'm going to do it. But everybody doesn't operate on that. And as a producer, I do have to be a professional and still open up and listen to them as well. So in other words, it's kind of like a big software release. You, you've got the release date, and you can't be chucking more features into the bin until you're pulling them out. And I'm trying to. I'm trying to add more songs. Yeah, I'm yeah. To, you know, I hear more. Like, is he, he, he says something that all, and, I, and that's just, it, it, it hit my spirit, what you said, because I've been hearing this for the past, like, like I talked to Quincy Jones, and he said he's hearing music the best he's ever heard it right now. Huh. Working with Herbie, 75 years old, he said he's playing and hearing the best music he's ever heard. He said he can't wait to get 80 years old. You know, it's like these people, it's like with the art and like being stuck. I, I believe if you're really in love with this thing, you're always going to want to grow. And that urge of wanting to grow and accepting challenges and wanting to conquer a challenge. Yep kind of voids out the failure thing in a way, too. Because it's like, hey, it's a challenge. Let's get through it. You know, I love, you know, going back to the jazzy thing, when, when, when Jimmy Iovine and, and, and everybody, well, everybody, everybody's not so into the jazz thing. Let me just say that. So Kendrick said, I want to do a record. I want heavy jazz influence. And Terrence, oh, no. Oh, no. We're not going to make people dance, make people this. No, no, we can't. It's going to be too much music going on, too much music going on. But, that kid had a vision, and he followed his heart with his heart. And now it's the biggest hip hop record right now, because he followed his heart, not because he followed trend on what's going on. And we don't believe in getting stuck. When one person gets stuck, we got to pull from the other person. We got to uplift each other in the art community so we don't get stuck. You know, those are very important things, so that's my thing. Very insightful. 
Uh, as of a follow-up to that, I have a question more about the, the business of music and that how do you deal with the commercialization aspects and outsiders trying to influence your sound and where you should go with your music? I didn't understand. It was a question about the business of music. How do you deal with the pressure of a commercial market uh, relative to what you think you should be writing? Or, or do you not? Well, I know, what, I know when I'm writing commercial music. I know when I'm writing concert music. Uh -huh. I know, and the people who ask me to do it, they know it too. <laughs> if, I'm a, if, I'm, if I'm writing a commercial for, for uh, IBM, that's one thing. If I'm writing a symphony for the New York football, it's a different thing. Uh -huh. It's not a problem. Well, that was easy. <laughs> Roger. I'm lucky enough to have a day job that pays really well in The Cure, <laughs> which allows me to experiment and do whatever I want without any regard to commerciality or if anybody wants to hear it, I'm very, in a very lucky position. So I wouldn't want to be dealing with that business side of music now. I mean, it's changed in the last 20, 20 years for new musicians starting, wanting to form bands, trying to make money. It's virtually impossible. So I've got no answers. <laughs> yeah, well, it is a kind of a moving target. I mean, when guys like Bach were around, the commerce was done around wealthy courts owned mm -hmm. by dukes or the church. And so you were constrained in different ways oh. and tried to push beyond those boundaries. In the 19th century, you had you know, big rooms and paying audiences. So it was sort of the, the Ringling Brothers approach to pretty much 20th century. You get movie studios. That became a new home for a lot of uh, musicians in a way with, with different constraints. And now we're in the sort of post-Napster era. Yeah. I want to add something to that. When, when, when I was trying to be a part of this music business, I would try to do what's going on now, or try to, somebody, because I, I was easily influenced by people saying, you need to do that, or you need to do that, you need to do up tempos, or you need to do that. And I spent like seven years chasing my tail, just trying to do what I felt I should, what people was telling me I should do. And the minute I stopped doing that and just said, look, because every time I did try to sound like something else, it sounded horrible. It sounded, I had the, right, the wrong drum selection, the wrong, it just sounded horrible because that wasn't in my, didn't sound it wasn't like in you. my, that's not my thing. And I didn't know then. Sometimes we get caught up in the business with, you know, making a living and, you know, doing that. And, but when I realized, man, if you just stay true to what you do and sit still, I'm, I'm a living witness that it works over time. And I'm still working out things and learning and still try to push forward every time. So, uh, Terrace, you talked about children and how they have sort of an unfiltered view. And, and we've all heard so much music. You guys especially have heard so much music and written so much music. How do you find a balance between your expertise and maintaining that child's eye and finding a way to sort of bring both at the same time. Oh, you're asking. Uh, uh, and everybody. Uh, I think expertise is uh, like we were talking about create the, the creative cloud or whatever you want to call it. Expertise is just a, a language that allows you to uh, communicate your ideas. If you have idea, all this music in your head <coughs> and you don't have the technique to to perform it or to get it out, then you're really stuck. I think when technique comes before creativity, then you're in big problems anyway, because it's not all about technique. It's about creativity. But you do need the ability to get it out. I mean, there was a big movements in music, like punk, where it was all supposed to be about not being able to play. And, but it, you still had to be able to communicate what, what your musical ideas were. I mean, we've probably all got different levels of technique, but we're able to uh, communicate what we feel and what, what our emotions are in music. Well, you know, a lot of people have the opposite problem. Uh, they're creative, but they have no patience for developing language. And I see that a lot. You know, I had a friend, great composer, Donald Erb, he said, the bars are filled with very talented people, you know. Um, but there's, that's, that's kind of part of what I wrote about, too. When it's time to play, 
it's time to completely open up to everything we've been talking about. But when it's time to practice, I think the joy of practicing is just concentrating on not just practicing some technique, but really owning something. And one of the ways people sabotage themselves is they practice too much stuff, and they don't really own anything. Just to own a little bit of something, you start to say, I can do it, you know? And that language will, will free, free you up, you know? You just have to know when to go, just for lack of better words, you have to know when to go in your left brain and when to go in your right brain. And I, I hope that's the right stuff. Right brain is for playing, they say. Left brain is for, you know, concentrating, practicing. I always tell people, if your practicing is inspiring, you should be suspicious. Uh, <laughs> a couple more. Uh, hi. There might be a little bit of an oddball question, but do you guys ever dream music? Oh, I do. What's that? Do, we, do you ever dream music? Music in your dreams? Yeah, well, that's part of that big thing, isn't it? I mean, if you could get that out. Mm. It's a hard one. It, I used to dream, not really, I mean, I, I, my dreams of music was like always me playing in Carnegie Hall with Bud Powell. <laughs> but with Jordans on. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, but, you know, not, I don't dream of music, but I've always, um, I remember playing in marching band in 10th grade, walking into the football field before the football players got there. And I always imagined I was playing like at Carnegie, just some jet, a setting and like, I remember when somebody scored a touchdown and they said, oh, and I, I would imagine them saying, terrorist, terrorist. <laughs> you know, he held, he held a note, you know what I'm saying? So those, those were the dreams that I had. And now, you know, I still dream about Carnegie Hall and Bud Powell. The, the, uh, just a couple of days ago, I saw a beautiful movie called Dreams by Kurosawa, yeah. Japanese. And uh, it's a, there are about 12 little stories. Uh, and he, uh, in the very first part, there's a house and, and some, something writing in Japanese on a friend of mine was there and told me about it. And it said Kurosawa on the house. So that was telling us that everything, and then, uh, the subtitles had a name for each piece, but in Japanese it said, and then I dreamed this, and then I dreamed this, and then I dreamed this. So beautiful. Dreams by Kawasawa. Mm -hmm. You can Google it, you can find it. <laughs> 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 Who's next? Uh, Einstein on the Beach has been a piece of music that I've been listening to on and off for probably more than 20 years now, so thank you for that. Um, and every time I listen to it, there's something new that's revealed to me. Um, and I'm wondering if the folks on stage can talk about maybe pieces or tunes that have withstood the test of time and that, that are still fresh and new even after they've been in your life for such a long time. Whoa, so many. That. It's gone quiet. <laughs> he wants to know it, tunes that have uh, stuck with you forever. The melodies. That just no, that, I think he said pieces you've listened to that you keep finding new things in. Is that yes. what you were saying? Right. Sort of like the layers of an onion, you know? Yeah. Music Not that you never time, tire of listening to. I kind of stop. I don't listen to much music anymore. Um, I ju it's just. I, you know, you're saying how you hear differently, you also start to think differently. More and more, it becomes just this very personal dialogue. It's not music. And I heard Herbie say that too at one point. It's not really music anymore. It's just these sounds that are coming out of me. And if I listen to a lot of music, I confuse it with music. Uh, I, that must sound incoherent, but mm -mm. Um, when I think of it as music, I get trapped. When I think of it as this, uh, sounds that I just have a tactile sensation or even a sensual relationship to, I start to expand. So it's not, I don't listen to something over and over again. You know, I just, I kind of like, first of all, I kind of like uh, the silence now and then see what comes out, you know, from there. I recently start, um, recently reconnected with some Stevie Wonder albums. And I remember listening to them at the time when they came out, thinking, 
that was just incredible. And you listen to them now, and they're just as fresh. And the sounds involved, like a lot of um, Moog programming from those two guys, uh, Bob Margulif and the other guy's name, but anyway. And you just go back to what Stevie did, and you just think, wow. And you've, you've worked with him. Yeah, that was strange. <laughs> it's, it, sitting up here is strange. I can't believe I'm even here. I'm like, what the hell am I doing there? But, uh, Stevie Wonder's one, um, for me, it, it's two records that I always pull from. Rather, sometimes for spiritual reasons, or just sometimes I just like writing to it. And uh, it is the Purple Rain soundtrack, Prince. Yeah. And A Love Supreme, John Coltrane. Uh, and I pull different things. Like when I listen to a, a, a Love Supreme by John Coltrane, I, I hear things different when he's playing. There's no words. But I hear aggression, I hear pain, I hear love, and I, I, I just hear something. When I first heard A Love Supreme and really listened to it, I was in 11th grade, and I was on the bus stop, and for some reason, uh, he started stolen. I, and it was broad. I just started running. I know everybody thought, why is he running? I just, I ran all, the music was so intense, and it, it fed me energy, you know? To this day, like, if, and I use that same energy, although it's jazz, but I use that same energy if I was doing a rock record, a hip hop record, in it. it's just the spirit of that. And then for other reasons, you know, I, I may pop out a Stevie Wonder record because I love the clavinet mini mood. Mm. I love the mini mood. I'll say it again. I have a, I have a collection of mini moves. <laughs> just picked up one two days ago on eBay. No, but <laughs> I love the mini mood, and, and Stevie knew how to make those mini, like, you know, it wasn't, you, couldn't, you can't play chords on the mini mood, but he would do these layers that we could do now, just with an instrument called the ocarina on the keyboard, but he would do these layers. And when I got a chance to talk to him, he was saying he was trying to make them sound like flutes and strings, you know, but he, that was, he was using the mini move, you know what I'm saying? The different instrument, just like the alto saxophone. I just, well, this, I just found out recently the saxophone was used to replace strings. Like somebody, uh, I was, I, I took a course at USC for like two days and they were talking about instruments was used to replace other instruments. And I think the mini move is very inspiring because you can just go a different directions. Yeah. You can make drums out of one instrument, the bass and everything out of one instrument. And Stevie Wonder does that. So that's what I pull from, different things. Are oh, you about to play? I have a couple of tunes in mind. <laughs> but it's just little things, because I don't have the obligations that you all have of producing music. I have the luxury of absorbing and fiddling around with it at home. And I just, there are melodies that stick with me over hundreds of years. Bach tune. Who, who doesn't like a good Rachmaninoff concerto? I uh, love Rachmaninoff. Liszt came up with nice tunes. Sort of the guy who would have been John Williams in the 19th century. John Williams. Indiana Jones, Marion's theme, which is closely <laughs> related to. Uh, <laughs> Princess Leia. <laughs> and there was. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the tune from Mishima that she wrote, Philip, that. that you wrote the score for Mishima. Yeah. There's this fantastic sort of... Um, something like that? Not ringing any bells? Wrong yeah, key? Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> I never tried it on the piano, though. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. But, um, you know, what, what everybody's saying, I think, is that... Um, that these little stories, these musical stories, they sort of stick with you. 
and they change over time the way the way we change over time. You know, you, you listen to a. Um, I get attracted to that piece over and over again every few years. It feels different to me. I have a couple of those. I have a couple yeah. of those. Yeah, what are yours? Well, I love this, this one. <laughs> uh, this always just takes me away. And it's a little bit improvised, okay, so. There you go. So forth. <laughs> Love that tune. That's you know that's actually a beautiful note to end on. We were supposed to be done three minutes ago. So yeah, well. <laughs> at least I think we are. Is it? Where's where's the? That's right. <laughs> okay. Deadline. You're late. <laughs> well, thanks everybody. This has been really interesting, and uh, I'm very glad to have been a small part of it. As uh, I hope everyone else has been. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.